TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. Particularly with like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. And if you do go live and you happen to miss the live, any great moments will be on this channel right here above us. This link is down below in the description. Go follow that, man. I'd appreciate it. I would really appreciate it. Um, don't forget, we do got the Patreon dropping two videos today. Might be three, but I got two done so far. They're gonna they're scheduled to drop today, so but I'm not gonna promise that third one. <laughs> I ain't even gonna lie to you. Links down in the description. I really appreciate this if y'all follow me here. Even if y'all want to look support me. Because uh, a lot of people ask me, how can I send you this? How can I send you that? Just sign up to the Patreon. That can support me. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want to just, I don't want no handout. Just, you know, I'm giving something in return. And don't forget, we got the Discord. A lot of these requests that I'm doing today are off the Discord. So, yeah. Links down in the description. A lot of YouTubers, a lot of YouTubers get into this mode where they think they know best. Oh, I got me here. I got myself here. But let, in all out honesty, like, okay, I granted when I first started, I didn't know what to react to when, when I was just reacting. But then once I got rolling and y'all start coming in and start showing support, y'all gave me damn near all of my... All of my topest videos that I've ever had. Yes, I had to delete all my videos. They're slowly but surely coming back. I'm putting them back on. But all of the viral videos I had before, y'all y'all suggested them all. <laughs> so I'm not against taking y'all requests and watching them. I, I, I do that. So number one way to be successful is listen to your listen to the subs, man. Listen to the game. Uh, and y'all can put y'all opinions here on the Discord. Link's down in the description. Um, this is from Coffee House Crime. I am sub to Coffee House Crime. I do like a lot of their stuff. Uh, they, 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 they be on, on it. Um, a sinister murder plotted on the dark web. The case of Re Isigi. I don't know how to, my bad. R.I.P. though. This was in the Discord as well, so let's get into it. I believe this is in the Discord. I can't remember. On August 17th, 2007, I think from so. the intimidating depths of the dark web, an ominous message appeared. The message read, I'm looking for a partner in crime. Would anyone like to work with me? Two other individuals would answer back, thus creating an underground friendship between three newly formed criminals. And moving forward, the trio plotted an elaborate and evil scheme to get rich. Their plans would target the vulnerable, and ultimately, it would cost the life of a terrified individual and leave a nation reeling in anger. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffee House Crime. Today we're looking at the disturbing case of Rie Isagai. Infamously He's he's from the UK, right? I can't I can't clock an accent right now. Maybe because I'm I don't know, but it's, it's a slight... Known as the Dark Sight murder in Japan, this case brought many questions around the nation's death penalty. Though, shockingly, yeah. it barely made any international headlines. Before we begin, and just to let you know, I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does- Hey, I'm already sub, my boy! You feel me? Help me out. And now, with that said, please, grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Rie Asagai. That's a W intro, huh? They got a little coffee grinding and everything. That's tough. Welcome back to Japan, folks. Found in the far east of Asia, this island nation is tucked away to the west of Russia, China, and Korea. It's a highly fascinating country, and with thanks to its geographical positioning, it experiences a jaw-dropping variety of seasons. Wow. We're talking several meters of snow in the north here. It snows in Japan? Am I too? Okay. Which greatly contrasts to its tropical paradise in the south. 
This case takes us near the middle of Japan's main island, Honshu. Aichi Prefecture is home to 7.5 million residents and is often referred to as one of Japan's main manufacturing hubs. Its capital, Nagoya, is the country's fourth most populous city, and landmarks include Atsuta Shrine, a tree-lined Shinto pilgrimage site, and the restored 17th century fortress of Nagoya Castle. And, of course, talking about one of my most favorite topics, the city is famous for its Nagoya-style tebasaki. Japanese- <laughs> Yeah, see, hey, listen. I love me a Japanese, Chinese, Mongolian, whatever. Whatever woman that, that could do this. Fried chicken is from Asia, if y'all didn't know. We didn't invent that. They think we did. We just be eating it, but they be doing that. Especially in Chicago, you go to the Chinese spot, get the Chinese fried chicken. Look at this. Perfectly golden. My bad, I enjoyed this scene too much. Chicken wings with shatteringly crispy skin, coated in garlic, ginger, and black pepper. Now, today's video requires more explanation before we get into the story. Although many of us would have already heard of the mysterious dark web and its disturbing connotations, never heard of it. Knowing what it actually means is very crucial here. Open any standard browser and punch in any old URL and typically you're surfing the web. But taking it one step further, if you want to access something confidentially such as medical records, your mail, or fee-based content like OnlyFans, you have to access the deep web to find it. Which, by the way, did you know that around 98% of the internet is actually classed as the deep web? The long story short here is that is it? if you want to access confidential things, then the URL URL you follow has to be both encrypted and time-based so no one else can follow it. Well, we're going even deeper than this. The dark web is a subset of the deep web that is intentionally hidden away, and furthermore requires a specific browser such as Tor to access it. Now, there are good reasons for this. One example is to hide customer and consumer data. And of course, with the intent to make something private, also comes a demand to exploit it. Which is surprisingly very easy to do. It's almost impossible to avoid the usage of the deep web and even the dark web. And with no adequate restrictive measures put in place, it is a free market for both sleuths and criminals to operate at will. Sharing your personal data online is a lot easier than you may realize. Every time you sign up to a website or subscribe to a newsletter, it often comes with a terms of service for you to accept. And unfortunately, it is as simple as that. By accepting the site policy or terms of service, you might actually be giving consent for your data to be sold and resold by hundreds of data brokers. This is where the real problem exists. Many of these data companies hold personal information like your name, gender, online alias, shopping habits, and even your home address. Smaller consequences include spam and targeted ads. However, in the wrong hands, people with the right information and a vested interest in you could do a lot more damage. And this is where this video's sponsor comes in, Incogni. Incogni helps you protect brokers' any objections. <laughs> yeah, you fit that in. Look at this. They gotta pay the bills. I get it for you. After signing up, it to work with the type of data but your online privacy below. And now let's get straight back into the dark web. But most estimates place it at around 5% of the entire internet, compared to 98% being the overarching deep web family, and only 2% being the typical non-restricted worldwide web. Now, despite its ominous sounding name, not all of the dark web is used for illicit purposes. But indeed, it is an area for scammers, fraudsters, and other illegal activity to flourish. And throughout recent years, felonious activity here has become more frequent, more severe, and even more creative. The worst corners of the dark web includes forgery and hacking, illegal pornography, and even murder for hire services. And on August 17th, 2007, amongst this dark virtual world, one fateful message appeared in the forums of one of these hidden websites. I'm looking for a partner in crime, the message read. I just got out of prison. Would anyone else like to work with me in the Tokai region? The ominous message's author went by the username Yamashita, which was a pseudonym used for Yami no Shokuan, roughly translating to the job of darkness in English. And the person behind it was a 40-year-old man who went by the name of Kenji Kawagishi. Kenji was not your typical stand-up citizen. Bullied as a child due to his ongoing kidney disease, he became a delinquent in Japan society. 
And although he eventually settles down with a wife and four children after several minor convictions, he would sadly eventually return to the world of illegal activity. In August of 1999, he began to use the dark web to obtain, open and sell bank accounts, which could then be used for fraudulent activity. Although this brought in extra cash for the family, his spending habits rapidly outweighed this new stream of income. And by 2002, his apartment was ultimately seized due to tax fraud and missing mortgage repayments. Damn. Now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, Kenji was also allegedly abusive towards his family, yet thankfully his wife didn't put up with his bullshit. She and the kids fled for their safety shortly after these signs started to appear, and eventually the two settled for divorce. But Kenji grew exhausted with his life after this, and between the years 2003 and 2007, he was in and out of prison on several convictions of fraud. Despite these charges, he continued to use the dark web after this, and often moved from job to job, which was usually in transportation or commercial security. No surprise, he in Japan, don't they ban you? Can't they ban your internet access, and if you violate, they can come for you? At the time of posting his message on the dark web, he had just come out of prison on yet again more fraudulent activity, and was now living out of his car in Isai City. And after reaching out into the unknown world of the dark web, three other men responded. Just a heads up, but we're going to exclude one of them, as eventually he bailed out of the scheme and was never involved in this case. However, the other two were far more guilty. Tsukasa Kanda was a 36-year-old with a similarly troubled history to Kenji. Bullied at school and suffering from chronic headaches, he was also abused by his father. And this volatile and deeply harmful environment led Tsukasa to join local gangs and commit minor crimes. However, eventually, in 1989, he graduated from Takasaki Technical High School. He began to use the dark web in 1997, was convicted of fraud, and then found himself a job at the newspaper company Asahi Shimbun. Allegedly, he often got in trouble with his colleagues and his boss, and his take-home salary was so low that he received weekly pocket money from his girlfriend to support him at the time. And so, similar to getting an allowance, that's tough. Kenji, Tsukasa was also in debt and was financially desperate. Yoshitomo Hori, a 32-year-old darts player from the same area, also responded to the message. And although he had no prior criminal history, he was over 4 million yen in debt, the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars or 25,000 pounds. Although there were several other replies to the message on the dark web, Kenji selected these two to work with. And just a few days later, on August 21st, 2007, the three met at Yoshitomo Tomo's residence. It is here that they began to formulate a devious scheme to make money. All three men were in crippling debt, and blinded by both panic and greed, they simultaneously expressed a cold disregard for the welfare of others. Their drafts contained several plans, which included pickpocketing, kidnapping, and even a heist against a pachinko parlor, which, by the way, is a type of Japanese casino. The trio tried to conduct one of these plans the next day on August 22nd, and the next day, they ain't waste no time. Desperation to make you do some cold stuff, man. And their plan was rather simple. Target a pachinko parlor customer, follow him home, and then abduct him and rob him of his money. However, after tailing his Lexus vehicle, they realized his home was alarmed and he had a dog, and so there was no way they were going to get him. After following another target home the next day, they were very disappointed to realize that he was in a very tight security building. And so, yet again, the heist was called off. The group came closest to making money when they used a stolen credit card to buy a gold necklace at the local Don Quixote. But sadly, or rather not sadly, this also failed. By the way, for those who don't know, Don Quixote is an incredible experience to have when visiting Japan. The buildings are usually massive and sells pretty much everything you can think of. And in a good way, I remember being absolutely overwhelmed when I went there. From instant noodles to underpants, frying pans to dog beds, and Pokemon costumes all the way through to, uh, Tenga eggs. Don Quixote like, what is this, like a mall? Tay has you covered. It's kind of like a multi-level department store cross treasure hunt, and I bet my bottom dollar that you'll be sure to leave with a suitcase worth of stuff. It's kind of like a... It's kind of like a mall slash, like... Like a, like a, like a... Dang, I forgot the mall that we used to have in Chicago. I forgot, forgot the name of it, man. They tore it down, but it's like little, little things like this. Dang, what was that mall called? Whatever. The place sells really cool stuff, and not even sure why, but when I went on Kyoto, I bought 10 of these in like 10 different colors. Kind of cool though, right? Anyway, 
So it appears that our three men were not having any luck with their plans, and with their failure came both frustration and desperation. And tragically, the very next day, and after upping the ante, their devious schemes would come with some very harrowing consequences. Flea market. Flea market. It looked like a flea market. It used to be one of those in Chicago. Uh, it was on Clark and... It was on the north side. Clark and something. Clark and, like, Ridge, maybe? I don't know. Flea mall. That's what, we, what was it called? I forgot. It was a long time. I was a kid. <laughs> Three reasons why Anytime Mailbox was the best investment for my side hustle. Bye bye using my home address as a mailing address, or worse, Yo. a P.O. box, and hello. I couldn't find my cursor. August 24th, 2007. It was a Friday, and at 10 p.m. that evening, young office worker Rie Isagai was walking through the streets of Nagoya to return home from her job. The day was long in the tooth, and with it being a Friday, the working week had overstayed its welcome. Rie worked in the office of a semi-local firm. Most of her tasks were administrative, meaning she was not someone particularly high-ranking in the company but was just as essential to keep it ticking along. Trying to find recognition and reward for her hard work, she stayed late to finish her duties that Friday. And by the time she had almost made it home that night, the streets of Kanagawa were dark and silent. But no worries. She only had a few more corners to walk to make it back to her front door. Looking into her past, Rie had always been a hard-working and thoughtful individual. She was born on July 20th, 1976, to her father Suiyoshi and mother Fumiko. Sadly, she was only a child when her father passed away, this tragically leaving both her and her mother to fend for themselves. But through this, the two formed an inseparable bond. And although she dropped out of high school, she impressed her mother by jumping straight into work. To add to this, Rie even held on to the dream of one day buying her mother a house. Rie loved board games. In fact, one of her favorites was called Go. And in her spare time, she often met friends and even made new- I've seen this game before. Never understood it. New ones at Go cafes across the city. She was a strong-willed person, yet caring all the same time. And now that she had reached her 30s, she was focused on progressing her career. Which takes us back to the story, to August 24th, 2007. Residing in Komei 2 of Chikusa Ward in- I like how he does his though, like, he gives you the backstory, makes it sound good, then goes back to the story, just so you can just so you can develop a relationship with the person. Ooh. Nagoya. Rie used the Higashiyama line to reach her local station at Motoyama. This was part of her usual commute, and sure. once there, she made the one mile walk back home. It was just past 11 p.m. when she walked past an idle vehicle. And with no reason to be alarmed, she ignored it without giving it any second thought. It was at this moment, though, that the car made a U-turn and discreetly passed by Rie. Peering up, she noticed a man nervously looking around at the buildings. And as she approached him, he turned around to ask her a question politely. I'm looking for the local convenience store. Do you know where I could find it? Rie stopped to answer. However, before she could even answer him, she turned around to see another man lunge at her. And all in the meanwhile, the car she'd spotted before had now hastily parked up next to them. Rie screamed out loud, but nobody in the neighborhood had heard her. And before she even knew it, she was in the back of their vehicle. A vehicle that was now speeding off into the distance. All this the con stemming from the dark web. That's crazy. It's crazy to me that 4% of, only 2% of the internet is worldwide internet. Then the deep web is 98% of it. And then of the 98%, 4% of the dark, that's wild. The deep web is like the ocean. And then the, the regular web is like the little bit of land that's, you know what I'm saying? The consequences of that night were discovered the very next day. A body was found around 35 miles northeast of Nagoya, and in the mountains near Mitsunami. It had been partially buried near a bridge from Route 33, and tragically, this body belonged to Rie Esagai. 
She was discovered by the authorities just after 7pm, meaning she had been missing for just over 20 hours. They didn't even execute the plan, they immediately- Despite being concealed in a remote location, she had been discovered very quickly for a very good reason, because the one to break the news would be none other than one of the killers themselves. Earlier that day, the authorities were greeted with a very concerning phone call, and after picking up the phone, the voice said, I kidnapped a woman, I stole her money, killed her, and then buried her in Gifu Prefecture. As you can likely guess, the three men to abduct and kill Rei Isagai were Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sakasa, and she'd become their first and only victim from the dark web. After abducting Rei and planning to rob her of all her money, they then murdered her in cold blood. Before so why, wait, the only reason they really got caught is because dude tricked on himself? Like, what was, what was up with that? He just had a guilty conscience, as he should. But, you know. 35 miles out of town and dumping her body. However, it seems like it didn't take long for Kenji's sanity to break, because by sunrise, he had become extremely paranoid. After making the call, he was detained by seven police officers dispatched from the Midori police station, and after being questioned for 15 minutes, he was taken to the mobile investigations unit before leading officers to the site. Now, Kenji was absolutely terrified of capital punishment. However, under Japanese law, he was not allowed to be executed if he surrendered himself first. And so, after his despicable uh... act, he was trying to beat them to the punch. Bro was out there singing quicker than Gunna. That's tough. Kenji was left with two options. Try to evade the law and risk his life, or give up his free life and guarantee survival. Kenji chose the latter, and in addition to this, he Got even confessed kids. that he had the help of two other accomplices, and even provided both their names and addresses. Yoshitomo and Sukasa were arrested the very same evening, and just hours later, Rie's body would be formally identified by her mother. Naturally, Fumiko was distraught by the news. Rie was her one and only child, with a father who had died decades before. The entirety of her family had now been lost, and Rie's absence left a massive hole in her heart. She described identifying her daughter's body as an out-of-body experience, and despite her daughter's body's chilling condition, she hugged her tightly through the pain and anguish. Colleagues of Rie were devastated too. They had known her for many years. Not only was she just a colleague, but she was also a friend too. By midnight, the Special Investigations Unit publicly announced Rie Isagai's murder. They further reported that three men had been arrested, and believed that no one else was at risk. Although only one had openly surrendered to the authorities, Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sakasa all eventually confessed to their crimes. They told investigators that they had met through the dark web, and that the primary motive was greed, to settle their unpaid debts. Furthermore, they also confessed that they were willing to do anything to achieve this, which- But I don't even understand, like, why did y'all take it to that extent? Y'all robbed her? Okay. Why didn't y'all just let her go after that? Sadly included murder. The details of this crime are particularly saddening. Okay, after being abducted, Rie was handcuffed inside the car and driven to a secluded area. The vehicle used to transport her belonged to Kenji, and had been unlawfully obtained through one of his former fraud schemes through the dark web. Her bag was looted, which at the time contained 62,000 yen, the equivalent of $450 or £380. She was then further pressed to provide her bank card's PIN number, but unknown to all three of them at the time, she she had given them a fake one. Shortly after this, Rie was then suffocated and beaten with a hammer approximately 30 times, and eventually, she heartbreakingly Dang, that's gruesome too. succumbed to her brutal injuries. The three assailants then stopped by a hardware store, purchased two shovels, headed out into the mountainous countryside, and at around 4.30am, dumped her body in mid-tsunami. At around 9am that morning, they tried to withdraw money from her bank account using the pin that Rie had provided them. 2960, or was it 2946, or 2460? Astoundingly, it seems that remembering four sin- So none of these idiots wrote down the- It was fake anyway, but none of these dudes wrote it down. Simple digits required far too much intelligence for these three men, as all three of them had forgotten what she had said. Despite already showing incredible levels of stupidity, it takes a special <laughs> kind of said incredible levels of stupidity. Hey, I couldn't have said that better myself. It said. Despite already showing incredible levels of stupidity, it takes a special kind of stupid to come to the next conclusion. But since they had failed to make any money this time around, all three agreed to meet again later that evening to find another woman to abduct, rob, and murder. However, as we all know, 
Before they could even get there, Kenji's conscience thankfully got the better of him. Following the loss of her daughter, Fumiko made it her mission to punish her three killers just as hard as they had punished her. And within ten days of Rie's death, she had launched a campaign calling for the death penalty for all three men. By the tenth day, she'd received the support of 100,000 people. Yeah, no, nah, no cap. They need that. They need that penalty of death. Uh, it's just in the, the gruesomeness of that they did it. By October was 150,000, and by December was 318,000 signatures. Not only that, but incredibly, even Yoshitomo's and Kenji's fathers begged the courts for the death penalty. Although single murders rarely face the death penalty in Japan, this case seemed to drum up a lot of anger in the general public. And not only that, but recent trends showed that people favoured stricter punishments. Initial court proceedings began roughly one year later in September 2008. I would be surprised if Japan did not give them what they asked, give the people what they asked for. And in this first session, all three admitted to robbing and murdering Rie. They further admitted that things got out of hand when they tried to live up to their boasting online. This is because all three men had claimed they'd murdered someone in the past, when in fact all three were lying to each other. Is your website oh, That's crazy. Murder was a qualification and they all was capping about it. Uh Defense attorneys argued that Kenji, Tsukasa, and Yoshimoto should not be punished with the death penalty because Rie's death was supposedly accidental. No, it, they how? <laughs> you, they suffocated, then hit her with a hammer 30 times. How is that accidental? And then the next day, y'all agreed to go do it all over again. That ain't accidental, that's premeditated. He also argued that, historically speaking, all single murder cases usually result in a life sentence and not the death penalty. Now, all three defendants disputed who was the primary assailant and mastermind behind the murder. Kenji insisted that Tsukasa was to blame, and Yoshitomo followed these allegations. But Tsukasa blamed Yoshitomo, claiming that he was the first to strike Rie. There were clear differences in attitudes during these discussions. Although all three men seemed unfazed and emotionless over their actions, Tsukasa often made fun of Rie throughout court proceedings, where Kenji said that the victim was simply unlucky. But on March 18th, 2009, Judgment Day finally arrived. Okay, the district yeah. court found all three defendants guilty of all charges, and as a result, Tsukasa and Yoshitomo were sentenced to death for their actions. It was ruled that their motives for the crime left no room for leniency, and that capital punishment was the only option. And Kenji was given a life sentence due to his early surrender. Although Rie's mother and ex-partner were both disappointed at Kenji's life being spared, it was widely recognised that a death sentence for Yoshitomo and Sakasa was exceptionally strict when compared to similar cases. As expected, all three men appealed to have their sentences reduced, and while Yoshitomo's death sentence would be reduced to a life sentence, Takasa accepted his fate and withdrew his appeal. This resulted in both Yoshitomo and Kenji being spared their lives. However, for Takasa, that would not be the same. And on June 25th, 2015, he was executed via oh, hanging. A sad executed via what? <laughs> same. And on June 25th, 2015, he was executed via hanging. That gotta be the worst way to go out. Like, like you, you deserve. He deserved that, but like, I didn't even know that could be. I, I didn't even know that was still a thing. A sad side note to the story, but unknown to Fumiko at the time, Rie had actually been saving more than half her monthly salary to help buy her mother a new home. At the time of her death, she'd saved up more than 8 million yen, which is the equivalent of $59,000 or £50,000. If it wasn't for their forgetfulness, her assailants may have even got their hands on all that money. But thankfully, they were too stupid to remember four digits. Regretfully, I see much familiarity between this case and the story of Eve Carson. Both were bright young women with great prosperity ahead of them, and they were both caught up in their day-to-day -day lives when bad luck and merciless tragedy struck. They were targeted, hunted, robbed, and then murdered. And for what exactly? A few measly hundred dollars? 
The motive behind their deaths is, quite bluntly, almost entirely incomprehensible. An entire life filled with friends, family, partners, love, hope, friendship oh, and prosperity me. was ended to temporarily fix the financial burden of an irresponsible low-life individual. The stark level of selfishness is entirely enraging, and now a mother has lost her one and only child. An array of people have lost a good friend, and a young woman has lost her life. To this day, Famico still gives lectures in various schools and places. Listen, I don't care what nobody say. I'm from my daughter. We'll know jujitsu at a high clip, and she hope <laughs> carry that meow with her if, if anything get out of hand. <laughs> teaching my daughter all of that. ...places to talk about her daughter's story. She provides insights into keeping people safe on the streets, and even raises awareness of dangerous online behavior. R.I.P. And that's pretty much where we are today. With Sukasa dead, both Kenji and Yoshitomo remain alive and behind bars forever. And so concludes another video today, folks. Thank you so much. No problem, man. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. I'm gone.